I met Christopher Lee in a chat room on the internet. We had a little conversation. Uh, as such, I began to look into his work. He publishes a blog out of his dojo in Honolulu. And the more we began to speak, the more I began to enjoy our time, his perspective, the work he's done in translating the writings of the old, uh, the sincerity of his commitment to helping people understand more and broader and deeper aspects of Aikido. And as such, Create a Beautiful World is happy to bring you a conversation with Christopher Lee. Christopher, thank you for being with us. There's a difficulty with Rihei Ueshiba. I mean, you talk about there are, there are very few people who are close to that. Um, Rihei Ueshiba is very difficult to understand. I think that's pretty widely accepted. Almost all of his students said they really didn't understand what he could get. Some of the students admitted they couldn't even understand what he was saying because he had a very heavy accent. You know, he, had, he spoke Wakayama Ben, you know, from the southern Japan. And uh, especially at that time, spoke in very, very difficult metaphors. Um, I think he wasn't, he wasn't uninterested in explaining, but he wasn't going to put a lot of effort into it. You know, he, he'd lay it out and uh, there, there was a high learning bar. You, you get it or you don't get it or you get it and you ask the right questions, or you know, we'll see you later. And um, so a lot of people, there, there was a real disconnect in the explanations. So Mori Hiroshiba, to my thinking, re received a, uh, a technical method from Sokaku Takeda, an intent-driven body method from Sokaku Takeda. Sokaku Takeda, of course, was a paranoid about secrecy. You know, the, he, he didn't teach people. He said, I'm not going to teach people. He told his son, don't teach people, right? Only teach one person, don't teach them secrets. Um, and he, he didn't really teach in any case, as most of his students said. That, that was one problem. Murihio Ishiba tended to imitate Sokaku Takeda in many ways. And I think for that reason, he was in some, in some, in some points uh, less than open. It's the same thing in any physical activity, right? Or any, any activity that you learn for someone. Some people have different abilities. They have different level, amounts of time to put into it. They devote different amounts of effort to understanding it. So, uh, of course, many of the students were quite accomplished. Uh, I think what, what they all had in common was that they all had a, a difficulty understanding the explanation. What they got, they got almost by feel, by touch. Even Seigo Yamaguchi, who could do some really incredible things, uh, admitted at one point that he didn't really understand how he did the things he did, right? He learned them by watching the founder, taking a chemi from the founder, uh, by feeling it, doing it. But he had the model right there, right? He had Rihio Ishiba in front of him. He could study that. Uh, then we get to their students, right? Their students are no longer feeling the original model. They're, fe they're feeling a copy of the model. And so the message gradually gets degraded. Now, and o Sensei's message was not easy. So if, if people don't put in the effort to, uh, uh, de to decode it or to figure it out what's going on, then uh, you know, it gets lost. You know, people who uh, just want to do Aikido as a social activity, you know, they go and it's an aerobic social activity. Um, and that's fine. You know, they're not interested in being combat arts. They're not interested in deeper unity with the universe or worldwide peace, whatever. That's fine. Um, but you also get people, as I said, there's a disconnect. Because there's a disconnect with the explanation, you get people who uh, are increasingly te technical, right? They're just doing, doing the techniques over and over for 30 years. And in a way, um, that was kind of the line that I got when I started, although I, I, I confess I kind of believed it. I mean, you know, you'd go into the dojo and then, you know, they'd show you this wrist lock, you know, this is Nikyo, and you know, do that for 30 years and you become a better person. And right. uh, they're like, we're in peace, right? And so oh, that's pretty cool. So I, I do that, and, you know, for a long time. And, uh, you know, after some time, maybe because I'm a little slow, you, know, you start thinking, how would that happen? I don't know how that would happen. I, I have no idea how that would even occur. Right, so maybe that's not such a great explanation because you look around at Aikido people who are doing Nikyo's for 30 years and maybe they're not such great people. And there are other people in other arts who are doing the same wrist locks and 
they're not, you know, they're not getting the same, those, those kinds of effects built into that particular joint lock or, or technical technique. Uh, technique. And uh, reading more of what else since they wrote and, and other things, uh, of course, those things gradually become clear. Uh, I'll get into that in a bit. But um, so you have the technical people. People are just doing technique. Of course, oh, since they never emphasized the importance of technique, right? He never got up and said, Aikido is Kotagai Shinikyo, Ikyo, Sankyo, whatever. You know, every explanation he ever gave of Aikido was not based on technique, it was based on uh, philosophical, spiritual, and technical principles, right? So technique is not a principle, it's a, an ex maybe an expression of a principle or it might be a conditioning method to achieve a principle, but it's not the principle itself. Exactly. One of the things Gozo Shiro said he remembers most from pre-war, when Osensei was arguably the most technical, was that Osensei always told him to ignore technique, learn it and forget it. Right? It's not, essentially speaking, very useful. It's gone. You learn it, you figure out the principle, and then it's done. You know how to do math. Uh, I think that Osensei saw the techniques in those terms. When you talk to Kishimaru Ueshiba, Kishimaru Doshu, at one point he says, uh, you know, I started studying Aikido around 1938. He said, I had already learned the techniques by then. It only takes two or three years to learn the techniques. Mm -hmm. two or three years, that's different than, you know, you've been in Aikido for 45 years, I've been in Aikido for 35 years. You know, that's uh, 33 years or 43 years too long, right? We, we should be done with that by then, right? <laughs> In most cases, you know, if you're studying even just purely combat-based arts, it's really a poor, poor investment of time you know, for the modern world. It's a poor investment of time probably in the ancient world. In, in 1500s and 1600s, people had other things to do, right? They're not going to spend 40 years just studying techniques. No, some of them did. Some of them become interested in the, the tradition. Uh, but that's what we have today, people who... Uh, they've kind of lost the explanation, although there's some lip service paid to it, and then they uh, become technical, technical practitioners in doing technique, technique, technique. And the technique is, is interesting. I mean, I, I love technique, I'm a martial arts geek, I like to look at different techniques, but sure, uh, sure. that's necessarily gonna keep me going for, for 45 years. You know? um, then you get another group of people, um, uh, maybe they're the love geeks in Aikido. And then people say, Aikido is love, right? And of course, that's true. Oh, since they said, Aikido is love, right? Aiki is love. They said, Aiki is the source of love. In 1933, way back when, when he was teaching Daichiru, teaching people how to throw people headfirst in the ground, he said, Aiki is the source of love, right? And that's all true. But then, one of the things that they never discuss is how you get there. Okay, Aiki is love. That's a good thing. That's the philosophy, and they said that. But uh, what the other, the part of the discussion is, that isn't usually brought up in that case is how you get there and how that would work. Uh, because Sokako Takeda was doing something unusual with his body, and all these people who met Sokeda, Sokako Takeda, they met Ueshiba, uh, all these people who met them became their students, were awed by them, were astonished by them, uh, all these people, when they meet them, they, they, they talk about how unusual they were, how strange they are. They did these things to them and they couldn't feel it, right? They don't know what's happening. I, I do think that it was a, an unusual way of using their mind and body, right? So in order to get your body to do something that it's not used to do, you, you have to use your mind. So, so, so Kako Takeda used his mind to control his body, of course, right? He used his mind, he had to train his mind, specifically because he was trying to move his body or use his body in unusual ways. He taught that to Murahe Oishiba. No. <laughs> okay. Murahe Oishiba, of course, sees that. He's using his mind to change his body. He's training his mind. Well, if you're training your mind, that gives you the tools to do other things with your mind, right? He's using it to affect his body, which is actually is a very useful thing to do, not only in a martial sense, but because you have a particular kind of feedback, right? I can think, oh, I, I would like to change my mind. I would like to stop smoking. But just saying that is very difficult, right? I would like to lose weight. 
Uh, of course, maybe you can hypnotize yourself, but it's a very difficult thing to do. When you're using your mind to control your body to do something very difficult, be it meditation or something, it's, uh, it's kind of a meditation with a feedback. So you can see, you can feel what you're accomplishing. Oh, Sensei took that intent-based training, I believe, and used it as his vehicle for his own personal and spiritual development. So for Murihi Oishiba, all of these things weren't separate, right? You get people saying, oh, I want to do technique, or people saying, oh, I just want to, I want to love, I want to be peaceful, uh, or I want to do this, I want to do that. But for, for him, it was all kind of one piece, the spiritual, the physical, the uh, philosophical. It was all part and parcel of one unified method, right? So... Um, at one point, he says that, right? At one point, he says, uh, you know, I achieved all this through uh, training in Aiki. He says, I don't know any other way to do it. That's how he did it. You know, that's how he's teaching to, how to do it. And, and, and when you get to that point, then you start getting into a neat little package. You have this physical method, which helps you to train your mind, or your mind helps you to achieve the physical method. I don't know if there's feedback loop there. Uh, you have that... that Training also evolves into training for personal development, for spiritual development, right? It all becomes part and parcel of the whole. Then you have something that, well, perhaps uh, if you say Aiki is love or Aikido is love, then perhaps you can start to answer the question of, well, how do you get there? How would you get there? Now, I'm not saying you're going to get there automatically by doing this kind of training or any other kind of training, but at least you know you have the potential to to get there. Of course, everybody you know everybody wants to do things. Not everybody gets there. Not everybody gets all the way there, however far they want to go. But at least you have the potential to do it. It opens up the possibility of doing it, which I think has kind of been abandoned in modern Aikido. You, you get lip service to High, highly philosophical goals, but no underpinning of how you would reach there. You have uh, uh, highly developed technical methods, but then nothing beyond that. It's all physical outer movement. Oh, Sensei said, Aikido is the study of intent. So when the flower of intent blooms, the world changes. It's a very powerful statement, right? Why would it change? Or how are you going to change anything? Uh, I had, there, I've had teachers from, uh, there's a teacher who comes off into Hawaii from Hombu Dojo, Sejuro Masuda. And I, I don't know what he's, specifically what he's saying when he says it, but one of the things he often says, oh, is, you have to change your mind. Okay, well, yeah, okay, everybody says okay. But that's really, that really is a very powerful statement. Before you can do anything of these advanced physical movements, you have to change your mind. But by changing your mind, it also gives you the ability to control your mind, right? Which is the key to everything, really, that you're doing. Whether you, whatever goal you want to achieve uh, in life, it's all driven by your mind, right? There are a lot of gaps, and there, there isn't that opportunity. You know, the uh, internet, of course, has relieved some of that, right? Because inf information is now more freely shared. But uh, people, more people need to get involved in looking deeply into uh, what was happening, what was being said, so that people can uh, discuss this with, um, in an educated manner, right? They can, because mo most of the discussions that happen, uh, they're all kind of, um, they're, they're, they're very opinion-based, and a lot of them based on what people's instructors have told them, right? Which is fine as far as it goes, but it isn't necessarily based on what, you know, what, what was actually said by the founder, which most people have never read, to be fair, either English or Japanese, right? They are the only translations available in English if you're not talking to someone who actually spoke to him, to spoke to a sensei, then probably you're looking at some book, which is um, the translations are partial. Uh, oftentimes they're taken from sources that have been altered in some way. Uh, they, uh, they're out of context. So, uh, it's important that, uh, that, that, you know, that we look at teachers as people who can give us those tools and not necessarily as exemplars of the, uh, of the perfect achievement. And even if they are achieve, they have achieved the penultimate whatever, 
uh, and I do if you're looking to sensei or any anybody else um, there's also a difficulty in that you know the, the best achievers not always the best coaches 1932 when I was interviewed I think it's the first it's the first interview I've ever seen I don't, I don't know if you've seen that but I, I put up a translation of it the first interview with uh, done with Osensei. 1932 he's asked is there a method? He says, yes, there's a method. They say, can anybody learn it? He says, yes, anybody can learn it. Unfortunately, the interviewer didn't say, well, what is the method? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I did see that. I did see that. But if you look at any other field, right, that's been around for a long time, any, any intellectual field that's been a long time, none of them will ever rely on one set of translations, right, from, from, a, from a foreign language or from, you know, from original materials. They're all, always multiple translations, translators argue about uh, what it, exactly what it was supposed to mean. Uh, people write scholarly works on what they thought. Another person writes uh, a work saying, no, he's full of crap. It was completely the opposite. And uh, I think for a long time, we didn't have that in Aikido, really on a, on a serious level. And I think that's important for it, for it to move forward. People have to the words themselves, and even if they don't agree, especially if they don't agree, they have to be discussing, you know, he says, I think he said that, and this is why. And so, you know, I, he's, I think he said that, and I think this is why. And uh, out of that comes, I think, uh, that, uh, through that process comes a deeper understanding. You know, if I go to, I think I was to have a vision of his particular method. You know, person, uh, it was a, a very personal vision, you know, just working on yourself. Right? What am I doing? I'm working on myself. Right? I'm training myself to make things better. Right? And and in a very very real, real sense, I think he understood that you can't uh, you can't force that on someone. Right? You, know, you can't really make anyone do anything. The only person you can really affect is yourself. And that, and that was much of what his training method was about. In the end, I think about changing himself in order to do you know, whatever he wanted to do. You know, he, he would characterize himself as uh, Ame no Minakanushi, the creator God, the central pillar God, right? That's me. He said, you are Ame no Minakanushi. It's all about you, what you're doing, what you're training, right? Founder said, I am the universe, right? The universe is me. Uchu sokowate, wade seku soko uchu. I am the universe, the universe is me. He never said, you and I are the universe. Or I'm going to make you be the universe, right? He said, I am the universe. It's about his training, right? How to train himself, how to train himself to become one with the universe. And you have to think, well, what is the universe? For Osensei, well, that, that, that becomes another complex discussion, right? So we toss around many, many terms, um, love, harmony, one's with the universe and we also have to consider. They help them see that yes, doing 10,000 or 45,000 Nikyos is not really quite what he meant when he talked about becoming one with the universe. And, and, uh, and yet, like I say, as, as Patrick said, for most people, I don't think they have a pathway. And if we can just even cause them, not show them the pathway, but cause them to start looking for one, I think we've made a good step. Yeah, yeah. Well, I understand the attraction of Summarization. You know, I, I have you know limited mental capacity myself, and of course, you know, in the in the internet age, I know a lot of the YouTube videos I watch. I look, oh, that's enough. Two, 20 seconds. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't have the time or the uh, maybe the attention attention span to listen to it all. So I understand the attraction of that. Um, sometimes the the arguments, of course, uh, as I say, many of them are complex, and they're not always clear cut. So it becomes very difficult to summarize, you know, oh, since he said this and that's it, that's the way, right? Um, for me, I guess what always brought me back to Aikido, I guess what started me out and what keeps me going different underpinnings or some of the same underpinnings, but maybe uh, a deeper looking at the underpinnings is that, that possibility for personal improvement and how, how that affects uh, the people around you. Uh, people, you know, the society as a whole. Uh, I remember George Ledyard said, once said to me years ago, he said, you know, if Aikido isn't making your life better, then stop it. Don't do it. Why are you doing it? Uh, and 
really that, that's true if you're going to do this something for so long people say oh i do it for this i do it for that uh, and then it has to be about you know whether it makes you feel good makes makes you makes you uh, a better person you know? or in terms of what people should be looking for or what i hope people should be looking for i, I think uh, I, i'd like people to uh, open their minds enough to realize that there are other things out there that haven't been discussed or perhaps haven't been discussed enough or that need to be discussed more uh, that perhaps not everything is uh, simple and cut and dried and already uh, a done deal already decided right there are there are more th more things in what O sensei said perhaps than are generally understood.